And uh, as Carl has already alluded to, this is the, the fifth uh, of the webinars that we've been hosted at this present time. Um, this one, I, I, as Carl has mentioned, salary sacrifice, staff benefits, savings and investments. I quite like this one personally. I like them all, but this one, because I think this one starts adding a bit of glue, it's just reinforcement again of what we've discussed over the last several weeks. So hopefully this will kind of put you in the right, right frame of mind to start taking those actions if you already haven't. Um, just to remind everybody, and if, you, if you're a veteran of these already, you will understand what I'm just about to say. Um, but look, I am a financial planner. I am a chartered financial planner. I am fully regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. Uh, and I work with Total Wealth Planning, who are also my employer, who are also chartered uh, uh, status regulated. But today is not about financial advice per se. Today is completely about education and awareness. And the hat I am wearing at this present time is the one further to your left, which is eulogy. And some of you would recognise us already, and some of us would saw us in the previous live pre-COVID when we used to see you in a face-to-face -face capacity. So today is all purely about education and awareness. Uh, again, I'll draw your attention to the, the, the bottom bullet point. We will be using stereotypical scenarios Again, please take this the right way. It's not to remove anybody and it's not for non-exclusion. It's purely to paint pictures in the virtual uh, perspective we are at this present time. Um, what I want to touch on here is there is a performed by DWP, Department of Work and Pensions, uh, and they've sponsored the Money and Pension Service. And what they have drawn up is five priority measures. And the reason why I want to allude on this today is this is what really Carla and David, myself and the team have really been strongly trying to get across. There's a few people behind the scenes I can't really really mention, I'm rubbish with names, uh, as some of you may know. But what they are trying to get clear, and this is what Carla and the team be working on behind the scenes, what we're trying to get across to you is trying to get across financial education. That's the key, and this is what all these webinars have been all about. But today we will be touching on the, the, the other uh, peripheral points, like saving on a regular basis. We will touch on credit and access and debt, debt advice. We'll touch on those today as well. We did allude to those on the first one, but overall, when we can start putting the four pillars, the, the first four uh, icons up there, it is all about you making these good future decisions about your well-being. This is about your financial well-being and making sure you have the right tools and know where to go and have your eyes wide open for the full awareness that you can make the right decisions for now, ready for the retirement, so your savings, your mortgages, et cetera, et cetera. And we're touching quite a lot of those today. The first one we're going to touch on is salary sacrifice. Um, what is it? In essence, what you're doing is you are receiving less pay. That's you are actually receiving less pay. And in turn, you are reducing your cash earnings, but you are receiving a benefit from it. So a salary sacrifice arrangement is an agreement between an employer and an employee where the employee gives up some of that contractual entitlement to cash earnings in return for non cash benefits. So in red, made it quite clear, your overall pay is lower but you will pay less tax and national insurance. And I think we're starting to weigh up now. We do know there's a lot of pros and cons with a lot of scenarios we're talking about here. So your pay will be less, but you pay less tax at NI. But there's been a few changes with salary sacrifice. It's kind of a moving feast, this one. And um, a lot of employers will offer a fair few more sal uh, salary sacrifice schemes and some others won't. And that is purely based on the demographic and making sure there's responsibility from the NHS in this case to make sure if you all have everything, you're going to have a reduction in potential salary. So they're also becoming a, a responsible employer, as you can imagine the NHS are here. But from April 2017, the government removed tax and employer NI advantages for sa of salary sacrifice schemes except for arrangements relating to pensions, childcare, cycle to work and ultra low emission cars. So there's been a few changes. So what I'm trying to say here is don't compare apples and pears and parents and spouses have so many and you have so less. What the NHS have tried to do here is actually an all encompassing amount of uh, salary sacrifice schemes to you, but they still have an employer's responsibility to make sure you have sufficient income coming in. So don't compare that to the other employers out there as well. We'll touch a bit about that later on. So what I've done here, you can see in red are the ones that no longer attract any form of taxation, national insurance benefits. And as you see, it's quite reduced. But the key ones at the top, there, the child care vouchers, cycle to work, car hire, lease schemes and on-site nurseries are still applicable. Child care vouchers, everybody, the, it's not the goalposts have changed, but I would certainly say 
yeah, there is a, a separate website for care choices, which is linked up to the government UK. So please uh, entertain that and please direct yourself there if that's something that you need to know a bit more about. And I have supplied you the link at the bottom there. But as I've said already, the employer's responsibility at the end of the day is to make sure you do have X amount of income coming in so you can still have a minimum of income that can provide for you, your loved ones, your family, et cetera, et cetera. Um, salary, all encompassing, there's pros and cons, and we'll be touching on those uh, in a minute, but I do want to make it clear. Pensions. We did one focused on pensions uh, entirely uh, several weeks ago. The 2015 which the majority of the NHS will be moved into or do, are moved into the 2015 pension scheme. Let's remind ourselves the 2015 scheme is what's called a career average revalued earnings pension scheme. So it's about what you have done throughout the whole career of earnings with the NHS. If you have sacrificed your salary, i.e. you have now got a reduction in income, that will have a negative impact on your pension, full stop. And they make that as clear as they can possibly do so. I'm trying to for, for you. Um, what we've got to understand and what you've got to do is weigh up the pros and the cons. Is it taking a mathematical decision that actually I know I'm going to have a reduction in my pension over here, but I'm going to get the benefit here? And is it worth doing? And we'll touch on that in the next couple. Of weeks. The 95 and the 08 scheme, it's not so catastrophic if we use that as a word, because with the 95 scheme, it's your best year of your final three years. So you can start manipulating when you start to reduce or retract away from uh, salary sacrifice. But secondly, the 08 is your, is your best three in the final 10 years as well. So you do have a bit of a headway and how you can start balancing and managing what you're going to do with salary sacrifice. Hence why we talk about the 2015 scheme at the top, just to make it quite clear that does will, will have an impact. It is based on your career average earnings. So please be aware of that. And so what we've drawn here is, look, does it have an impact on your living wage? I would suggest that anybody before they do salary sacrifice, and I'm not trying to belittle it in any way, but it is a massive financial decision. Please, again, we've talked about a tax tail wagging the dog and those type of benefits and look at this new shiny bike, etc. cetera, um, and childcare vouchers get it, but that's only gonna be for a limited period of time before children grow out of childcare vouchers per se. But before you start using these type of benefits, do an income and expenditure document. All right, and I've supplied you information with that historically in Carla and Dave, and send that out as a word document to you because before you commit to this you know now that your income will be less if your income is less you are taking home less, less income which then eventually if you're looking to borrow money for mortgages or unsecured borrow, borrowing that will have an impact a lot of mortgage borrowers um a lender sorry do base things still on income multiples so again, you don't want to kind of trip over this. Certainly if you're a younger generation and you're struggling to try and get onto the savings ladder and then onto the, the, the mortgage ladder. Um, as I've said already, your overall pension benefits can be impacted. Certainly in the 2015, it will be more so, but certainly can be in the 95 and the 08 schemes. Your potential disposable spend will be less, all right? So even though you've got something new over here and some benefit over here, you've got to take it from here. It, it's still the same pot of money. You're just, so you've got to have that engagement, understand what impact, pros and cons that's going to have. Is it more economical to purchase this directly? Now, this is actually, you know, we're going through COVID-19. Every man and their dog is getting a bike right now. And it's like kind of Tour de France around our neck of the woods at this present time. Um, however, when you speak to some individuals, social distancing, obviously, um, they're beginning to do this through staff benefits. Actually, when you know the bike, them over long term to gone directly to the bike provider but hopefully that person would have done the mathematics and worked that out for themselves we don't know um the situation so it's just touch what i'm going on are you saving money really through the staff benefit of salary sacrifice or is it best to go another way is it best to lease a car directly i'm not saying it is i'm not saying it isn't i'm just it is a massive financial decision which does have positives and ramifications for the longer term, certainly the 2015 scheme, as I've mentioned. All right, so you've committed today, you're gonna to do it. If you've worked it all out, it's a good thing to do, but it doesn't mean that you should stay in that position. It's kind of what we do with our gas and electricity, our car insurance, etc. We shop about. 
again, it doesn't mean you are getting the best gig by keeping where it is with, with a salary sacrifice. Um, and I've provided some links there just to give you some direction of, of that for you as well. You've seen this already, um, and I'm going to keep laboring it um, before you make any financial decision. Do this anyway. You should always be doing an income and expenditure document, at least annually. Um, however, before you make any larger decisions, can you afford to do it? Will it have an impact on my discretionary spend? You are still earning the same amount of money. It will be reduced. You've just directed it in another place. So your disposable income will be less. Is that going to have an impact on your holidays, your savings, your mortgage overpayment, maybe your gym? Have that check. Check and balances. That's what it's all about in this case. So we've talked about salary sacrifice. We look on our money management or taking control. We touched on this on the first webinar, uh, but this really will keep coming back up again. Um, Simply down to the facts, um, we know, and we'll be talking about savings earlier on, and this has come from the Money and Pension Service, and again, they're, they're sponsored by DWP, so I kind of take their, their stats quite literally. Um, 11 and a half million people have less than 100 pound in savings. All right? Nine million struggle to buy just food on a, on a regular basis. 22 million people say they don't know enough about retirement planning. And again, this is where I kind of tip my hat off to the team that you who are arranging all this because they're trying to give you this information in advance. And 5.3 million children do not get meaningful ed financial education. Again, let's pass that out into the adult world. We were all children. We know we never had enough education then for finances. And that is definitely it's systemic within adulthood and with occupational health, so to speak, when it comes to financial education. We know it's drifting through. So trying to get into the schools is a big, a big yes, what we're trying to get involved with here. But having debt to management of money. Let's, I, I've put it in red, debt management. Um, debt is not a problem. Let's... It, we all potentially on this on this webinar, uh, certainly the majority of us will have a form of debt. A mortgage is a form of debt. A credit card is a form of debt. Paying your expenses, you're on debt technically, and then you pay it back to credit. Um, is it bad? No, it's not. What when you lose control? So I know my mortgage is X, my credit card is Y, and my car lease is something else. So I, we will add that together. And can I still have a disposable income? Can I still buy a supply of lifestyle for the children and the wife? 100%, yes, I can do. But we still got to keep our money under control. But if I start borrowing and borrowing and borrowing, that will come out of control. And some of you on this webinar will know that and have appreciated that and are going through it right now. I will certainly say, let's take control. Taking control. And we had a really, really good question last week, uh, asking the question about who is scared about, um, about uh, facing debt. What is the best way to face debt? How do I face debt? Then just making that question was pivotal for that person just to realize maybe, yes, I am in debt. And yes, maybe it is beginning to spiral out of control or they already knew it was. And I take my hat off to those type of individuals because actually what they're trying to do is they've acknowledged it straight away. With experience, debt is not a sprint. You will not pay everything off. Your next pay packet, etc. It is more of a marathon. Um, it is something that you chip away it uh, month in, month out, every pay packet, and you may have to go without in certain places. But the sooner you face it, the sooner you face that control and take control, embrace it, then actually you are doing the right thing. And remember, if you've got an, an, uh, an interest rate attached to this debt, then the more that you are borrowing, the less that you need to pay back over that period of time. It all adds up, it's mathematics. So look at it, do your income and expenditure, understand uh, where, where we can go with this and, and, and seek support, seek advice. There are plenty of free, uh, uh, free advice services out there that can help you uh, and support you with this. So please acknowledge it. It's not a bad thing. Every form of debt can be controlled and overcome, but it's a two-way relationship. It's you, and the people around you they are going to help you out. So what I've done here is I've provided you a kind of a screenshot of the fruit that's available to you. I know these slides will be available. Um, there's going to be a few places there that are going to be uh, obviously recognisable straight away, cab, citizens advice, etc. cetera. Um, but entertain that. Please look into them further because they can put you in the right direction. I think over the COVID-19 crisis, as well as mental health, Debt services have obviously enhanced because of furlough payments, potential redundancies, et cetera, et cetera. But um, 
it's about embracing it please do so it's it's not a bad verb it's not toxic it's definitely not a toxic environment to be in which then brings us into this change curve um we have seen this slide before a couple of times and as i've made clear i'm a fan because i think this is just how we ride through life on a daily basis weekly etc and we know there's going to be furlough that's, that's already happening we are pretty damn sure now economically we're going to hit a recession um how that's going to impact ourselves is that going to impact your spouses your partners there's nothing there about talking about the private public sector but there's redeployment redeployment which is affecting the, 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 the curve but this one is really focusing on the financial behavior and as i allude you to there's the one is, is your chat right in the middle about acceptance the sooner we can actually engage this and take the control and start understanding it and hit it face on and actually what you've done is you've started now accepting it that's the key thing you've accepted it and now you've got the realization to deal with it and you will have energy and when you start seeing that debt begin to drop you're going and it does it really does i can promise you it does been there i have been there um access to staff benefits um there's a lot there is a lot out there um now i'm not going to teach you a case many of you will know i've got many people uh, friends and family uh, within the nhs and police etc and they all seem to have this blue light card so i'm not going to teach you this. but if you don't know about it again these are screenshots for the next couple of slides they are all screenshots i have left the websites at the top but entertain it because actually if it's saving you three five percent here or there and plus some you are saving money in your back pocket and if you're saving money in your back pocket you can start doing something a bit more cuter with it and that's talk about regular savings and extra pensions which we we'll touch on later on this is the staff benefits we've got nhs staff benefits directly again i've given you the website there this one i understand not many people do know about so hence why i'm really kind of advocating this one it is there for you to use please use it if you can save any form of money it's only better in your back pocket than theirs and finally this was actually uh, provided by carla last week um doing some investigational work and these are companies that are actually gone through to the nhs and said by the way we are happy during the, the c19 uh, crisis to provide nhs workers x amount of benefits there are some very nice benefits here and it's something you should utilize now I would say there's over 100 all uh, generally to, to, to the top of it. Um, tucking foods at the bottom is not your primary one to go to. Go to the website, look into it and check it out. And these have gone to the, through the NHS directly and they've kind of done their screening and provided this via the site there. So please entertain it. Um, as I've said, it's better in your back pocket, the savings than theirs. And you want to make sure you're making the most of these. And again, what it's trying to do is make you take control. Uh, could I get a better deal here and there, actually, and therefore I've got more disposable income to spend on what I really want to do, which is actually the grandchildren, the children, the holidays, savings, etc. So we're moving on now. We've got the NHS credit union here. This is only viable to some of the NHS trusts there, I understand, but I am going to talk about them because actually there's a few of the, the, the offerings they provide are, are, are great. The first one, as you can see there, the headline figure is the secured loan rate uh, cut to 3%. All right, they are lending money at the 3% rate. Now, we know interest rates are rock bottom. Obviously, they are lending out money and borrowing money is expensive in any way. But obviously, if you borrow money, you're going to look for the lowest interest rate possible. And do that, do that. Today. Now, with, it, uh, with the credit union, they're offering a 3% rate there. I've done my research and actually that is kind of the going rate at that present time. But the key thing about the credit union at this present time is simply what they're doing is actually they provide you other options. And this is what it's all about. It is the options. They're offering loans. They've got regular savings, instant access savings, junior savings and Christmas savings, and they are protected. Now, the FSCS, the Financial Services Compensation Scheme, protects money and cash savings up to 85,000. This really hit paramount during the Iceland crisis and during the credit crunch. The one I'm going to kind of draw your attention to here, these kind of quick wins, and it's the Christmas savings account. Now, you don't have to use the credit union. That's entirely up to yourself. You know, we're completely impartial. But I think the key thing about the Christmas savings account is they're just little quick wins where we know that people put things on credit card and it's kind of a um, it escalates to a bit of debt at the end of the year. And they have to all start having to play it back at the beginning of the, the following year. It's the hangover event. We all know that. 
the persons that we know that start to save in 25, 50 pounds a month and put it in the Christmas savings environment, which is also protected by the FSCS, that actually what they've done is they've already got a head start and actually not so much damage is hit on the credit card and against that regular spend they have about the November, December and January time. Preparation. And that's what I'm talking about this one. It's, just, it's a short term preparation because Christmas is annual. We all know that. But it's just those little things. It does help. And it stops that because of many pay, the amount of people that spend a lot of money at Christmas and in January, they spend pretty much from January to October paying it all off. And that's not good. That's not healthy to start prepping for that one in, in, in advance. Cost of living. Um, Basic economic facts. Let's let, we've got, let's try and get these across. Uh, and there's only three three ones I'm trying to get. The Bank of England base rate. We've touched on that. That's interest rates, 0.1 percent, all time low. Um, they had over 12 years ago. You were talking three five percent, um, and your savings would go up by three five percent. That's not going on right now. So interest rates right now 0.1. The index. In fact, that is what your pension income is increased by even working income is increased by CPI. But in the month of April, it actually dropped down to 0.8%. It usually is targeted at 2%, as you can see on the, on the right-hand screen. What I'm trying to say to you is, inflation in this country, the cost of living should be going up about 1%, 2%, at least annually. But we've got interest rates at 0.1%. And if you're putting all your money in cash environment savings, that's not a problem per se, but you are backpedaling. Because the cost of living is going up, and your savings are not following it at the same rate. So by having it all in cash, be very, very careful, all right? And we're gonna be talking about savings shortly. Mortgage overpayments. So what we've looked at so far is we've talked about uh, trying to save money, manage a bit of debt, um, get out of the debt control side scenario. Uh, we've talked about um, the, the credit union, and we've talked about starting saving on a regular basis. And so what we're looking at now is this, Talk about people now have got a bit of disposable income on a regular basis. What do we do with that? And do we put it all into savings? We've just touched on interest rates. Or do we put more into our NHS pension, which is another conversation itself? Or do we start now paying overpayments on our mortgage? Which, again, we're a fan of. All right, covering mortgage overpayments is not a bad thing. And all I've simply done here is just done some, uh, just, just done an illustration graph that if you overpay your mortgage by £50 per month, based on a balance of 150,000 over a 25 year period on a relatively conservative interest rate of 3.5%, you will save yourself a grand over that period of time. And that makes you will be further debt free to basically two and a half years sooner than what you would be. That means you could be six, seven, 800 pound better off each month, two and a half years sooner to your retirement date which means you can do something special with that money. And it's about planning, as I said, right at the opening screens, about planning for that future, that well-being, that retirement, that lifestyle planning. Or maybe you do more of the lifestyle pre-retirement. That's entirely up to yourself. But what it's doing is it's giving you options sooner rather than later. So instead of paying all your money into cash savings or all your money into investments, as I've said before in these other webinars, use a pincer movement. Entertain about overpayment of mortgages actually also save some money in the investment ice arena, which we'll touch on soon. What you're doing then is you're coming in from both angles. And we know in the middle here, your backbone is your income. And your secondary backbone will be your NHS pension income, which you should continue to pay into to that pension. So you're buying yourself options. And that is where we're talking about debt management. And we're talking about looking around and making the best of these staff benefits that are out there for you. If you can save yourself 30, 50 pounds a month because you're using some of these percentage benefits that are out there, by the by the NHS and you can put that into your mortgage it's a win it's a win-win now 50 pounds is going to be a lot of money to some people in some other cases it's going to be quite economical I'm only using 50 pounds as an example because I think that is quite an affordable amount of money so we're looking at inflation again um I demonstrated this to David uh, earlier on last week. And if we look ourselves right at the bottom, I think we're all drawing because we are all we all know that we've been probably drinking a bit more than we should usually. And hopefully when the pub's open, we'll be drinking less. But we can see there just a typical inflation rate. Pretty much everything has doubled in price. This is courtesy of the BBC. So I thought I'd make the most of it. It's quite recent. It's May 2019 figures. So it's circa 12 months old. Um, apart, apart from beer, this kind of trebled. Uh, and in some cases, probably more than that. We know 
lifestyle is increasing. And as I alluded to earlier on, inflationary linkages, inflation, cost of living will go up. Is your lifestyle ready to be this checked? Is your money that's in your savings that you have going up at the same pace? I promise you, it probably isn't if it's in a cash environment. We look at savings and investment now. Um, the first thing I'm going to talk to you about is asset classes. Now, very high level asset classes and what does that mean? But anybody here who's got an investment ISA or anybody who's got a private or personal pension, a stakeholder pension, or had a defined contribution with Nest or previous life pension, this is pretty much how your money's invested at a very high level. It's made up of cash, uh, corporation bonds, government gilt, so that's money lent to governments or companies, commercial property, that's not your residential home, and shares, investment shares, we all know about shares. And what I'm saying here is the higher risk you take, the higher return that you want. But if you put it all in shares, you really got to know that actually your money will go up and down more volatile than obviously cash. But is there a right one to go with here? There isn't. There isn't. You should always have cash in isolation for an emergency pot of money. But actually, if you're looking to entertain investments for the medium, longer term, don't put it all in shares, but don't have it all in cash and don't have it all in commercial property. Have a blend. It's called a portfolio. You might have heard the old adage, don't put all your eggs in the one basket. That's what it's all about. And this will include things like infrastructure, commodities, uh, such like coffee, cocoa, et cetera, et cetera. Right. If you ever get investment advice or receive investment advice about personal pensions or investments, et cetera, per se, like uh, investment ISAs, then any, and, and you, some of you may have experienced this, if you've ever seen a professional advisor, they would do what's called attitude to risk scoring review. And it's made up of a number sequence of multiple choice questions usually that give you those answers. Please do not be hoodwinked into making high risk decisions. If you're being told to make a high risk decision by an advisor, you run away. Literally, if you're being told to go for low risk, you run away. This is about you making the decisions. This is an impartial event. The advisor is there to guide you, but it's definitely not there to tell you exactly where you should be. So those questions are answered by your own facility and how you feel you want to be. High level, though, the majority of the UK demographic usually fall between a three and a seven. But if you're year nine and ten, you're usually individual shares and low risk. One and two is like your cash accounts. Right. Now, this is a screenshot from I today, which is one of the logos on the entering slides that we offer here. We haven't really talked about I today. But this was really designed to help people start saving on a small amount on a regular basis. What I've done today, uh, and this is quite a busy screen, but let me talk you through it, is to give you an idea of investment growth, the pros and the cons and the pitfalls and the, uh, and the positives. The top left hand corner, we've invested £10,000 and we're going to save £100 a month there afterwards. And this is over a period of 10 years. And this is, again, very relevant to investment ISAs and also personal pensions, very similar outlay. The risk grade is five, which means you're a medium risk investor. The green is your positive growth. And there's two big blobs in the middle there, black dots, North Pole, South Pole, I call them. And it's what it's saying. There's a 90 percent chance of your money achieving anything between 22 to 41,000 pounds over a 10 year period if you invest in a risk category grade five. So you can see now the amount of differential in that period. The red is all about negative growth. And what we have experienced, people that have missed out on education of investing is in recent months, because we know what the markets have done, they have come back down, they're sliding back up again. People took all their money out. That's the wrong thing you can do. It's kind of selling your house and moving to a rented accommodation when the house prices crash. You just don't do it. And in fact, when the markets go down, people that say regularly like in investment ISAs or into pensions, actually what they're doing is they're buying good quality stock at lower prices. So keeping with it is not a bad thing. What you do want is actually the markets to be really high when you want to put this money out. But if you're saving over a longer period of time, actually the market's going low every now and then. It's not an issue. It really isn't. Because actually, as I said, you're buying the good quality stock at lower, lower prices. And this is very relevant to personal pensions, AVCs, investments, et cetera, et cetera. But this is high. This is uh, kind of a forecast, scientific forecasting. However, this is fact. If you did this 20 years ago, your money would have actually gone up and down like it is in those bar graphs. And hopefully your computer screens are giving it justice. What we have 
years is there's been 15 positive growth years and five negative years. And the worst one was in 2008, as expected, which is a negative 11.8. Now, this is only up to date to the back end of 2019. The beginning of 2020 was very good. And then we know what's gone on since then. The markets have slid and they're coming back up again. But what I'm trying to say to you here is if you don't need your money tomorrow, and you don't need it for another three or five years to actually start entertaining saving on a regular basis at least 50 100 pound a month for plus if you're looking to put lump sums away obviously we say seek financial advice as well but over that period of time you will see that your money has grown more superior than cash but you've got to accept that there's a thing called risk and return risk and reward sorry and if you do take investment your money will go up and down so it's all about time when you take that money out again seek professional advice to help you through that maximize tax avoidance now tax avoidance is okay it's tax evasion which is the naughty one the big three is national savings and investments nsni we've all got premium bonds we've all heard about premium bonds sorry junior ices and direct ices investment ices are in the middle and i kind of alluded to how they operate behind the scenes they're ices have a have a bit of everything as i've said do the pincer movement, talk about a cash account, emergency spending, just in case the boiler break down, the car break down. Make sure you're contributing to your pension all the time. If you can look to overpay on your repayment mortgage or, or any mortgage in any respect, that's good. Downgrade your debt as much as you possibly can do and start saving on a regular basis. But then suddenly you've got no money left. And that's not what I'm trying to get to here. What I'm trying to say is pick your battles, but at least deal with the debt first and then disposable income after that. Start doing the right things about savings, ready for tomorrow and your lifestyle for the future. I'm going to allude to the ICES a bit more. The reason being because they are so tax avoidant um, and there's a lot of positives about ICES. They replace PEPs and TESs at the turn of the century. Um, you can pay up to £20,000 into them. Um, they have kind of uh, walked over the last number of years. Originally, it was just a typical cash ISA, but now you've got the junior ISA that you can pay up to £9,000 in. Uh, the Heiser, the how to buy ISA, that's down. That's now being downgraded. There wasn't a massive take up on that, to be frank. So that's actually closed back end of last year, but you can still continue to save in 2029 for those who have already done that. The lifetime ISA is kind of a pension reversed. Um, which is uh, it's maximum 4,000. And then you've got the innovative finance ISA, which is quite like typical peer-to-peer -peer lending. But the key thing about ISAs is if I put all my money into pensions, I know my pension income, and you will know this now, your pension income is taxable at your marginal rate. But if I put money into my savings, my investment ISAs, the income I draw from that is tax-free. Now, historically, it was always a battle. Is it pensions or is it actually ISAs? There should be never any conflict between the two. They actually should be hand in glove contribute to your pension and if you've got still disposal play money into the investment isa because therefore your investment isa you can take money out anytime you wish to it's capital gains tax-free and income tax-free well your, your pension certainly the nhs budget, you can't take those ad hoc costs out you can't do that because the way the scheme works but the income is also potentially taxable it's not about right or wrong it's about having a combination it's buying yourself options and that what is what is the bigger picture of financial planning is for you Kind of wrap that up. Um, you've seen the screen before. I will really lead us out to the left. Income expenditures key. Look at that. You cannot really make any decent financial decisions without actually understanding what's going in and what's going out. If you haven't got that, then actually you're going to do yourself over somewhere along the line. Look at your protection. So we haven't really alluded much to about protection over these courses of webinars, but actually you are looking at things like your income protection. You're looking at death and service, which you've got with your NHS employer, private protection, mortgage protection, etc. Your assets, your liability. Look at the family, the education. Are you protecting your family now? Are you looking to protect them? Or are you looking actually to generate a family for the years to come and give them a relevant lifestyle? But actually, it's the, it's the penultimate retirement lifestyle and preparation. You are all at work. And actually, it's the preparation of that. And if that's coming from basic debt management to actually needing help with debt management, to actually beginning to do a cash savings, knowing a bit about your pension and actually getting re-engaged with your pension or preparing for that retirement. 
We've covered a lot over a last number of weeks. We talked about the estate planning, the legacy planning. Actually, what COVID's drawn in is people now need to realise we need a will. We need last and power of attorneys. So what the Carla, David and the team have done behind the scenes and what we've tried to present to you over the last number of weeks is all encompassing, trying to bring this all together for you to give you that better relevant education. Go in with your eyes wide open. Start with the income and expenditure and start working yourself upwards. And as we've alluded to already, more than happy to provide an after, we provide, we've always provided an aftercare service free of charge. Um, the, the email address is info at Unigy. Some of you on this webinar may have already engaged with ourselves already. Some of you, the feedback, has, as Carla said right at the beginning, has been quite positive, which is all good news. Um, but if you do wish to make contact with us, please uh, email us at info at Unigy. Uh, your name, brief indication of what you want to talk about, is it are, are pensions, estate planning, etc. A contact telephone number, and if you can put code C5 just for administration or monitoring purposes, that would be grand. Um, advice, if you ever need advice, as I've already mentioned, look for chartered status, look for a chartered status uh, company. Make sure any plan, if you've got a planner, brilliant, have that relationship with them. Make sure they're fully regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. I will make clear, and I, you know, I had a conversation yesterday evening, uh, a lady gasped because I said it would take about three months, two to three months to get all this work finished for her. Um, but that's because professionals will do the right thing and things do take time to get done. If somebody's saying 24, 48 hours to get done, again, run a mile. It's too quick. You cannot do a proper job in that period of time. When you're getting correct professional advice, it does take some time because professionals need to break down the DNA of the relevance behind it. Same goes for the estate planners. Again, you're looking for the estate planners, the legacy planning, etc. Don't use the people to hang outside Tesco's or car boot sales, etc. Um, do you want contact with ourselves? Please, uh, we, we do comply with the G, uh, General Data Protection, our GDPR. Um, but um, everybody, it's been great. I really enjoyed doing these webinars. I know we're doing one next week, kind of a, a, a final wrap up, so to speak, with David and, and a couple of his colleagues. Um, but in the meantime, obviously, as I said, any contact, please info uh, at unigy.co.uk. And uh, I hope there is, there's probably going to be some questions, so I'll answer those questions for you now, Carla. But in the meantime, keep safe, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Neil. Another fantastic webinar. And uh, just to confirm, really, yes, Neil and his team will offer that one-to-one -one support by telephone. And that can be scheduled to time, maybe, as a household. So if you and your partner and your household wish to join the call together, you can. This is about the, the, your um, finances in your entirety. Um, so I'll, I'll pass it to, to David. David, are there questions that you'd like to ask Neil? Yes, and thank you, Neil. Hi, David. Uh, they're on a broad range, so um, I'm going to do them more or less in the order they came in, if that's okay. Some of them, are, I think, uh, will test you a little bit. <laughs> Great. Let's, go, let's go for it. If you had to choose one key benefit and one key drawback of salary sacrifice, what would each one of these be, please? Um, let's go back to the let's go to that slide so we can bring everybody else into the, the, the conversation here. Um, but the key benefit is the tax relief on, on that. So you pay less tax and national insurance benefits. I think the, the key one is probably more the childcare vouchers. As we alluded to, that other employers do provide other benefits. You do what's the right thing for the household at the time. Um, I'm going to just say this from a personal perspective. The childcare vouchers worked really well for me, my wife and the children at the time. And actually, when I weighed out what I was going to be paying, less income, but what the tax saving was, it absolutely made financial sense. But it did come to a point when the wife went back to work and the change of nurseries, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, it was something we don't need it anymore. And we're kind of chasing good money after bad. So the positive there to answer that question, uh, I'm going to answer it three ways, actually. Positive there is the tax. You know, you're getting a benefit. You are paying less uh, in tax uh, along the way and you're getting a benefit back from it. And actually that weighed better because we're getting more of a benefit versus what we would have paid out if it came out of our net back pocket. But the drawback is... I will now go to say the car hire and the lease scheme. What we do find of those is people just get in this regimented view that it's actually just a done thing. That's the right thing to do. 
And what they've done is they've put themselves in this cycle. Actually, they just continue doing the same thing, the same thing, the same thing, without reviewing it. They just get the next car, the next car. And that's not to be, that is very stereotypical view. While children naturally grow up, you do fall out of childcare vouchers by natural default anyway. With car hire and lease schemes, you can, as soon as you get a license, you can carry on driving to your work with the NHS. So what I would say in here is the drawback is you do need to review it. And, I, and again, going to that income and expenditure document, I think the, the biggest drawback right now is how it will have an impact on the 2015 scheme. And we know that now the vast majority of the demographic will fall in the 2015 scheme proper or definitely have a phased amount in the 2015 scheme. So we know the government have changed the goalposts. We know the feast is a moving feast and potentially probably less than what it was several years ago. But I remember the days when you could actually get tax relief in your pension contributions, uh, sorry, your life insurance contribution. They've gone. Um, so yeah, there's the pros and the cons. And I'm hoping the slides is not negating really salary sacrifice is a bad thing. What I'm trying to say is the word is sacrifice. You are sacrificing a proportion of your salary to get something. And with that, you really got to bear what that has on the, the, the ramifications of your lifestyle, what you want. We have people that have done the car lease, even child care vouchers, which no longer can save because they've actually got less disposable income. But we, like, we go to that change curve, wherever I put it's somewhere along the lines, that's life, isn't it? Let's face it, we, 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 well, one minute we're up here, then children, which is really, you know, I've got two children, bad financial planning children, because suddenly you had some money and it's just dropped off the, off the ravine and then back up again. Um, so you change curve, you're never going to have a plateau with financial planning. You've got to move with the times and be dynamic with it because, uh, you know, the scenario we're in right now, fur uh, furlough, recessions, redundancies, et cetera, et cetera, can have an impact. Right. I hope that's answered that one the best way I possibly could. Uh, this one is not a question uh, as such, but we'd welcome your opinion. And it is, I wish there was a salary sacrifice scheme or equivalent to contribute to care fees for elderly relatives that require professional care. I've no need for childcare vouchers, but the cost of adult social care is immense. Oh, 100%. Couldn't agree more. I, I think there is a massive, massive void uh, and I'm, I don't know if my, my fellow professionals are listening in right now uh, with eulogy and, and total wealth planning. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually going through this right now with my with my with our family circumstances. I have done for the last couple of years. There's a massive void in it. It has to be addressed full stop. And that's definitely, unfortunately, Neil can't do that and the team. It's definitely something that needs to be looked at. Uh, I, I know it has been touched upon, uh, but I agree wholeheartedly definitely do so it, it's, it's there's got to be more options other than just blatantly to selling someone's house to pay for the care fees or you know destroying someone's cash accounts to do that um so yes yeah, so i can't give you a diet answer but i do absolutely agree with your uh your, your, your primary question there i agree too next question if i work part-time for the nhs but also draw a pension from another part-time employer what should I look for from each employer so that I can choose which one I apply for salary sacrifice from? So we've got a working income and a pension income. Is that correct, David? I, that's how I would read that, yes. Okay, so you won't be able to get salary sacrifice, as far as I'm aware, from a pension income. I think, actually, I would read that as two individual part-time incomes. Which one would I use to apply for the salary sacrifice scheme? What would I look for in each of the employers, I think? So, um, I think what we've got, to, first of all, we've got to understand what both those incomes are bringing in. Secondly, we've got to understand, uh, remember what I've said earlier on, the employers have now got, because you've said you're part-time, the employers have a responsibility to make sure you have a minimum wage coming into play. And NHS are all over that, to be honest yeah. with them, compared to some other employers there. They're very conscious of that. So. Number one, I would say, what type of benefit are you looking for? And what benefit is the salary sacrifice and offering you? Can you get it cheaper in the private marketplace, call it? Um, second with that, actually, it's really down to, if it's two different companies, what are they offering for yourself? Thirdly, are they gonna allow you to do that? Because if it's gonna bring you down below the minimum wage, they may not allow you to do it because the employer can be fined a, strong, a stupid amount of money if they fail to do that. So they may not even allow yourself. 
Um, but it would, I would certainly say, it's probably do also down to an individual knowledge of what that income is for you and what is the knock on effect of your expenditure. For you, what you'd look out for, uh, uh, first of yourself, look, what you're doing, is, as I've said already, you are sacrificing that salary. So it's whatever one that you feel is, is the one that's not giving you the right benefit. If you've got one part time job, earning a bit more than the other maybe you'll be able to do that it depends really what income you've got and will the employer allow it because of the uh, the, 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 the minimum wage wage policy um, and some employers offer different benefits than others um, so it depends what you're looking for but I'd say go back income and expenditure can you get it cheap on the private marketplace and then entertain salary sacrifice thank you Neil you've You've answered this next question, but I think it's worth reading. There's no response required. And the question was, are there any circumstances where an employer could refuse to offer a salary sacrifice? I'm thinking if the employer thinks it's not in the employee's best interests to reduce the salary. I think you've answered that question. Thank you, Neil. Yeah, yeah. so I just allude to that. Just I just extend on to that. So as we said, remember what salary sacrifice is. Again, sacrificing your salary, that means you're going to get a reduction in income. Now, an employer, a good responsible employer like the NHS, they have to make sure and they will make sure that if that drops down, your salary now drops below the minimum wage, then that's actually their due diligence has been lacked and they can be fined. Employers can be fined for this. So this is why you do find some employers offer more than less. Um, so you've they just got to be careful. And that, what they're just trying to do is outlook, they're trying to look out for you because if you start we did see this several years, well, a good several years ago. A lot of salary sacrifice kicked in. It was all in vogue, but still, people were re receiving less money, which means they have an impact on their pensions, an impact on mortgage borrowing, certainly, and disposable savings, all because they've just kind of thought they were getting a tax relief somewhere. But it's not all about that. As I said, don't let the tax tail wag the dog. <laughs> Moving on to investments. I have an interest-only mortgage on a property that I rent out. What are your views on overpayment on an interest only mortgage in this situation? Um, well, it, it was what's your end goal? With so um, if your end goal is to live in that property, then yeah, yeah, absolutely. You'd be looking to do the repayment perspective. Um, the, the advantage by doing a repayment, even if it's a rented property, is the debt that you owe is less. And you would hope the debt goes less and the equity value of the property goes up. And that gives you bigger span of, of, of monies. However, we have also got to bear in mind what rental income does. Rental income is a taxable event and has to be declared because it's along with pension income and working income, etc. Also, you've also got this void of what's called capital gains tax, which Rebecca talked about a couple of weeks ago. Um, could it be no deal was a couple of weeks ago. Where actually on a secondary property, let's call it, it is a secondary property plus, you will pay capital gains tax on that. So it depends what your end game is. If it's about buying the prop, uh, eventually living in there, then yeah, you want to have no debt at the end of the day because you want to have an apex over your head or some description and live mortgage debt free. If you're looking to sell it on, then remind yourself that actually you will potentially have to pay capital gains tax. There are costs you can negate against that. You've got income tax you've got to be conscious of. Um, some people then go and buy another property, but remember you've got escalated stamp duties on secondary properties as well. Um, so if we look at just look at a broad thing any type of debt overpayment is ideal certainly for primary mortgages yes overpayment with that with that question plus you would, we would want to know a bit more about what the end game is what's the what's the aims or objectives of that person before we can get a bit more technical guided on there also you've got a legacy headache to come about which rebecca discussed as well who inherits that secondary property who is it mm. going to etc cetera, etc cetera. thank you neil uh this is okay uh, this one ends with the words i appreciate it's not advice it's just your opinion and the question is <laughs> i've heard that investing in gold is as reliable as it gets what are your opinions on this oh, do you, I, <laughs> I remove my old slide replace it the bbc slide <laughs> but um let's have a look i've still got it up on when we have a screens I think it was since 1983, but I remember gold is only made 5% if you compare it to today's prices. Now, gold is reliable as a commodity because we've seen it through uh, the wars. We've seen it from since man began, gold has been there. Um, 
but it will go up and down in value. It's a commodity. Now, let's look at gold. If we got one gold bullion, let's face it, is that person going to keep it in their house? Got to be careful. Um, people then have to pay storage fees. Is that gold actually going to give them any form of dividend or interest? Remember what equities shares do. They provide a dividend. Remember what cash does. Even a small is still interest. Commercial property, rental income. So corporation bonds, government guilds provide coupons, which is another form of interest. And what that does is that gets rebalanced in and buys you more. It's like bacteria, actually. It just expands and expands and expands. But with gold, you've got to pay a storage cost, potentially. Um, your gold is only as worth is what the person is willing to pay for it. Simple as that. And that's done on, on ounces, as we well know. And that goes up and down on a regular basis. Now, if the world had kind of imploded and that was your barter uh, to move about, like we've seen in some of these dystopian programs and films we've seen over the years, gold might have some kind of relation to it. I would say it would be, I would say form it as a part of a portfolio than actually just all plowing it into gold because it's only as good as what someone's willing to pay for it and how much is that going to be at any given time um yeah it's part of a portfolio i wouldn't just i would say buying gold is just as a risk as just buying shares outright actually that right it's up there it's, it's, you just put all your eggs in one basket thank you i want to start a private pension but how do i choose a provider what if the provider goes bust I have 30 years still to work. Okay, so um, if the NHS person, and I'm going to kind of put words into that person's mouth, the first place I would go is have your NHS pension. You've got 30 years left to work, so that's say you're fairly young uh, in pension world. So I would say always uh, um, kind of qualify yourself to take your NHS pension. Uh, Neil, I think I could read into this a little bit. I think it would suggest in addition to my NHS pension. All right, so we've got what's called an ABC, like the tissue was called an additional voluntary contributions. Yes. But that's the old school type of framework. Um, so well, the, look, you're, we're protected. We, we're actually, uh, love or hate financial regulation in this country, we are pretty well protected w w within that. So your money, I say regarding pensions anyway, it is, is protected at the 100% levels because pensions form into life cover uh, type scenario, life and pension scenarios, while private in savings and investments fall under financial services compensation scheme, which I alluded to earlier on with the credit union. Um, but remember what I said about um, the, the this, yeah, let, me give you, let me just allude you to the, the, this bit here, is Remind ourselves, private pensions and investment ISAs are pretty much similar to how they operate. But remember, if you put all this money into a private pension, you can't access it right now till age 55. But because you've got 30 years to go to retirement, I imagine you're going to be, have to be about 57, 58 because the rules are going to change to go upwards. How, who doesn't know you're not going to need that money in the next 30 years? I don't know if you've got a mortgage or if you're looking to save for a property. Have you got, have you got children? Are you planning to do stuff for your children, holidays? There's all this peripheral we've got to bring into play first of all. Because actually, if you don't have a safe cash savings, and we would certainly say you've got to start entertaining medium term savings to help with these additional costs of life. If you put it all into pensions, it's locked away. So I would say combine a copy of the boat. And we know what your aims and objectives are, what you've got behind the scenes also, then yeah, absolutely. Paying more money into private pension is well worth doing because um, you get the tax relief on the contributions. Again, the methodology, what I've just discussed here on this slide, how it's invested is it, it's really, it's, it's brilliant. There's a lot of free money with pensions and investment advisors are obviously ideal. So maybe that might be a kind of an after course, so to speak. So I just get a bit more of a flavour of what that person has got and what's nothing to do with it. Thank you, Neil. That brings us to the end of the questions. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, wonderful. So we've got three minutes um, remaining. I'd just like to give you an indication of finale session next week, which we will um, provide a expert. So we've met Neil, we've met Duncan, we've met Rebecca and Martin and David, all of those lovely people with us next week we will be concentrating on coaching and how coaching can help with your financial well-being but of course please do remember that 
Neil and his team offer the one to one support. Um, so please do email them and they will do what they can in terms of returning that call in a very quick turnaround time. Um, I guess with no more questions at the moment, what I will say is that all slides will be shared and the recording will be shared too. If there are questions that haven't been answered today, we will post those to Neil and we will send those through as a, an FAQ sheet to you all. So I guess on that note, it's, it's bye from me and I guess bye from David and, right. <laughs> and I guess bye from Neil. Um, our email address is um, agem uh, agem.od at nhs.net if you wish to email myself or David about anything you may wish us to do for your organisation. Um, otherwise, I'm sure you've got the email now to contact David and his team. So thank you for joining us on our webinar five for Wednesday Wellbeing Lunch. Stay safe.